If you have a Bible, would you ignore the people in the front pew? If you have a Bible, would you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13. Paul writes, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Let's pray. Father, may we be encouraged with the reality of the fact that Jesus came and died and was resurrected, but we may we also be encouraged in the fact that he's coming again. Father, may we encourage each other. May we understand the hope that we have. May the second coming become to us something that we long for, not something that we're always just looking for. May it be something that we hope for, not something we're afraid of. And Father, until we are with him, may what we do honor and please Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. The title of this sermon series is called Here Comes the Sun. S-O-N, by the way. A little different than what we just listened to, which is a song by the Beatles, written by George Harrison. The B-side, first cut of the album Abbey Road, for those of you who remember when things went vinyl, or the seventh cut of the CD, for those of you who know, or just an MP3 that you probably can pay way too much money for on iTunes if you just want to get that one song by itself. Well, this series is a series not about the Beatles, although you're going to wonder here in a few minutes. It's a series about the understanding of what we call in theology eschatology, or what we more commonly know as the things that are involved and surround the last things or the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's been a long, long winter. It's been a long, long time since Jesus left. And when the sun comes, the question is this. Will smiles be on your faces? Not only that, but is the second coming is something that you want to study or is it something you're afraid to study? Generally, when you start about second coming, there are basically two general approaches. One is a guy who's got a bunch of charts and a bunch of news clips who's looking for the second coming everywhere and in everything. And he generally focuses on the most negative material on the face of the planet to see an indication that soon Jesus must be coming because it cannot get any worse. And he'll write a book about it, or he'll do a sermon series on it, and if he lives another 30 years, he'll have to revise his book and talk about how things now are much worse than even 30 years ago, which is just another sign. Or, the same guy will start date setting. Are you familiar with the name Harold Camping? Harold Camping is the guy who wrote 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. And then he wrote, everybody ready? 89 reasons when Jesus would turn in 1989. And then Harold Camping went so far to buy billboards a few years ago, you remember this, where he predicted the exact date that Jesus would return. This is the one approach to the second coming. If you think over the next five or six weeks or so, I'm going to give you the exact moment Jesus is coming back, you're going to be sadly disappointed. And I know that, that really frustrates The other approach... And that's the approach that will once again hit the silver screen, only this time with everybody's favorite, whatever happened in his career that he's something this low, uh, Nicholas Cage, and is the concept of trying to not focus on the second coming of Jesus, but this idea of what the history of the world will look like after some sort of return of Jesus. And then we got to write books and movies that basically are intended as like bad Christian horror stories that are supposed to scare you into the kingdom. Which means the idea that here comes the sun, there's nobody where the smiles are returning to their faces. Because you're either too worried trying to figure out what's going on in Syria and Iran and Iraq that's leading to the end, or you're wondering whether the Ukraine is going to lead Russia and China into some sort of global collision in the Middle East, 
or you're thinking about every political person elected anywhere and how their name somehow coordinates with certain numbers, or you're busy just scaring people, the, the hell on earth is coming if they don't repent right now and come to Jesus. And that's the only reason they should come to Jesus, because we've got a horror story about the end of the world. We're not going to take either one of those two approaches. We're going to focus on the fact that the promise that Paul makes here, we believe that Jesus was resurrected, and as a result, he will come again. We're going to emphasize in this series the reality that here comes the Son. That the second coming is a reality in the Christian life, and it's a reality, as our subtitle says, of the hope that we have in Christianity. If you had flipped over that Abbey Road album and listened to Here Comes the Sun, about three tracks later, you're going to be amazed when you hear the words Here Comes the Sun again. Only instead of being written by George Harrison, it's written by John Lennon, and it's got some sort of odd sort of Latin or Spanish lyrics that I still don't know what they mean. But more importantly, the middle lyric of the song, Here Comes the Sun King, listen to these. Here comes the Sun King, here comes the Sun King, everybody's what? Laughing. Everybody's happy. Why? Because here comes the Sun King. You know what, if we change that letter from U to O, the truth in the Christian realm is, when Jesus comes, there should be laughing. There should be happiness. There should be joy. This is our blessed hope, Paul said. Let me ask you this question. Based on how you study, or based on if you were in Thessalonica, I think the question we have to ask is, will everyone be smiling? Will, will, will the smiles come back to everyone's face in the second coming? Or is this supposed to be that doctrine that scares us to death and leaves a tension where we go from the resurrection to the second coming and we just are always in fear and not real sure what's going to happen? Because it seems in Thessalonica we've got a problem. I don't know about you, but if I opened the sermon and said, hey, I don't want you all to be ignorant, you may think that I don't think much of you. <laughs> Paul says to the Thessalonians, catch that again, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant. Hey, don't be stupid about the second time. But it's not the second coming they're ignorant about. It's ignorant about what happens to those who die. Here's an understanding that chart guy and date setting guy seems to struggle with with the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians are assuming that Jesus is coming back any minute now. They're not sure when it's going to happen, but they're expecting it to happen, guess what? Any minute now. Apparently Paul didn't have his charts together yet, or his dating system ready, or he wasn't just keeping up with CNN to decide this is clearly a sign Jesus will return. So what's going on? Well, I think we've got some clues. I think we have a clue to understanding. First Peter chapter 3, notice what Peter says about Paul's writings right after he had warned us that the return of Jesus being delayed is not a sign of God's forgetfulness, but it's a sign of God's patience. It's a sign of God's continuation of our goal to reach the world with the message of the gospel. 1 Peter 3.15 Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother who? Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking to them of these matters. His letter contains some things that are hard to understand, which, there's an interesting word, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Paul writes to Thessalonians and says, here's what I want. I don't want you to mess up the second coming. I don't want you to get confused by it, and especially the most troubling issue for the Thessalonians, and maybe for some of us, the troubling issue that we have as well. If Jesus is coming back, and Jesus is coming physically back into this world, then what happens if I die before he returns? And it becomes even harder if you're a Greek convert to Christianity in Thessalonica. The Greek understanding was simply this. There's the physical and there's the spiritual, and the two don't really intersect. Well, the soul may live on, it may not. And if Paul's promising that the second coming is a physical event, 
Then the Thessalonians are really worried that everybody who came to Jesus with them has died as we've been waiting for the last 30 years, or 25 years, for Jesus to come back. Man, did they miss out? And if they miss out, and Jesus delays another, I don't know, 10, 15 years, or imagine if Jesus delays another two millennium, then will we not receive the promise of the gospel that we have received? That's the question that Paul's addressing in this text. You say, why do you tell us that that's the issue that Paul's addressing in this text? Because if you ever deal with the second coming, there's a very important verse in here where we never talk about really focusing on those who have died. Look at this text again on verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive... And our left will be, what are those next two words? Caught up, together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord forever. Does anybody know what the words caught up uh, are translated into in the Latin language? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Rapturo. Does that sound familiar? When we're talking about the second coming. This is a question about the rapture. What exactly is the hope of the rapture? Depending on the variety of views, oftentimes the rapture is the scary part of the horror story. This is the part where Nick Cage is going to find himself as a pilot with half his passengers missing, according to the previews. I also say this to you so you don't invite me to watch that god-awful movie, okay? I'm just going to throw that out there right now. On October 3rd, when it opens, don't call me. I don't want to go, okay? But this is the scary part of the story. And this is the part on this side where we're trying to figure out whether we have to date the return of Jesus plus or minus seven years, or plus or minus three and a half years, or, and it gets a little confusing. And we take away the fact that ultimately, when Paul teaches on the rapture, he answers the question, will everyone, everyone who came to Jesus with me be smiling with the answer, it's all right, we somehow lose that hope. We lose that comfort in this reality. That the same Jesus who died and resurrected is not going to forget a single one of his children. And not only that, not a single one of his followers, not a single one of his disciples, not a single one of the children of his father is going to be, ready for the word, left behind. Amen. Here's what the text addresses. And this becomes the hope for us when we stand by the grave, that when we sing after we have placed the body in the ground and speak of the fact that we wait for the blessed hope, and then somebody, especially if you go to a funeral in Kentucky, decides that that's time to sing, of course, the one and only hymn that we can sing about the, the second coming. I'll fly away. All right that we have the hope that everyone is going to be there on that day. But Paul takes it a step further, because here's the Thessalonians' concern. You know, I came to Jesus because Grandma came to Jesus, and Grandma was old. And Grandma had heard when Paul came through town and preached the message of Jesus that he's coming back to set up the kingdom that he spoke of in the Sermon on the Mount. And Grandma wants to be part of that kingdom, but Grandma's dead. Well, Grandpa's dead, and Jesus comes back. Uh-oh. I mean, I get to be part of the kingdom, but what about Grandpa? And Paul says, you've, you've got nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. In fact, let me tell you the timing of, of how this all works. With a shout and with a trumpet, 
By the way, I would throw out there that this may be a time that the rapture is not a big secret event. You got shouting and trumpets. That seems to be a pretty big event that people should know and recognize. In fact, in the Old Testament, trumpets and the voice of angels generally precede theophanies and the appearance of God. I just throw that out there. Paul says, what happens? Oh, oh, you're afraid you're going to be left behind? No, 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 no. The grandma's going to be left there in the grave? No, let me tell you how it's going to work. According to God's own word, well, we will tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not, what? Perceive those who are dead. <laughs> we know this from things that Paul taught. Paul teaches this in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body, because if we are away from the body, or if we are dead or asleep, then where are we spiritually? We're at home with the Lord. Paul says, guess what? Those who die, they've already experienced some form of eternity with Jesus. In fact, we would prefer that. But for the sake of the gospel, he says, we continue on. Paul, when talking about his own imminent death, in Philippians 1.21, says it this way, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Does Paul seem like the guy who's worried that if Jesus doesn't return before he dies, that somehow he's going to miss out on Jesus? No. And then Jesus, and then he gives us the timeline of Jesus' return. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not receive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ, what? Will rise first. They get preeminent. If you've lived your life completely for Jesus, and you find yourself in the grave, then when the archangel calls out the boarding plan, you find yourself uh, getting to uh, be like those who have children, or are handicapped, or are members of our special elite pass club. Anybody ever boarded an airplane before? Because you all stared at me like, what's he talking about? You ever notice those people always get to get on the plane first, even though you're going, I was sitting in this chair forever. I, I was here. I was alert. I've been waiting for the plane to arrive. Paul says, they get first boarding. The resurrection of the dead will occur. They will rise. They will meet him. And then we, who are alive, will meet him as well. And once that happens, This is it. This is what the kingdom is. The redeemed of God, with God, forever. <laughs> That's our hope. The second coming is a promise that if we faithfully endure, if we faithfully put our hope in Jesus, that when he comes back, we're with him forever. Whether Jesus delays another two millennium or not, guess what? Regardless of how many more dates are set, and maybe one day one guy gets it right, and no matter how many horror stories about the return of Jesus are continue to be created, are written and filmed and filmed poorly more often than not. I don't understand why I don't get asked to write these films. Um, if we die before he comes back, do you know how much of the second coming we will miss? No. None of it. None. Nothing in eternity starts without us. So what's the importance of both groups meeting Jesus? Because the reality is eternity doesn't really kick off till we're all together. Because, I mean, look, we can go back to 1 
Corinthians 5. If it's better to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord, then why don't we just start heaven the second we die? Because it's not truly heaven. Because guess what? Not everybody's there. You know that. You ever had a family dinner where you know that there are still relatives who are supposed to show up? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> when do you eat? When they get there. When is it finally the family gathered together for the patriarch or the matriarch of the event? When everybody's there. And here's what Paul says in Thessalonians. Quit worrying about the second coming. Quit worrying about it like it's something to be feared that you're going to miss. Because the party cannot start without you if you're dead. And the party won't start without you if you're still alive. Now, is that a comforting message? Or would you rather we spend all of our time discussing whether this is a secret event or whether it's a public event? Whether this is a secret event that then precedes the scary story that starts with the poor Nick Cage on an airplane. And then it takes this scary horror story seven years and probably at least seven movies to tell it. <laughs> or do we take Paul at his word? And say, here's what you need to know about the second coming. Jesus is coming. Everybody's going to know it. And if you're his, you're going to be with him. And once you're with him, from that point on, you're with him forever. Amen. Nothing can separate you from him at that point. To be honest with you, I literally like what Thessalonians says a lot more than what we generally do with this material. I know some of you are disappointed. Some of you are wanting me to pull out charts and give you a timeline. Others of you are frustrated that I uh, <clears throat> may have just taken on the most popular understanding of the second coming in America right now and told you I think it's a bunch of, well, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't agree with it. Here's why I don't agree with it. Notice the signs that Paul gives of this rapture event. A shout. Command of the art, command, shout of the archangel, archangel, let's try that again. Let me just read it instead of doing this. He will come down to heaven with a loud command or a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God. Those are pretty unambivalent terms, right? Command or shout, voice of the archangel, and what else? A trumpet. What did Jesus say? Because Paul said it makes him very sure, according to the Lord's own words. Well, what did Jesus say about the second coming? Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 and 31. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, or the four corners, or from all over the earth, from one end of the heavens to the other. Does that event sound anything familiar to any other event we just read about in Thessalonians? I was asked this morning by someone who was told by a guy who was studying the Bible with it, he didn't believe in the rapture. Because he didn't believe in it being the secret event, followed by the Nicolas Cage story, followed by another return of Jesus, or possibly a second return of Jesus, and then maybe a third return of Jesus, depending on which model you use. To answer your question, the reality is, that's not what Paul says the rapture is. Well, I tried to tell him that. The rapture that Paul talks about, us being caught up, has nothing to do other than possibly preceding judgment, but it doesn't focus on those who are not part of the kingdom. Jesus makes it very clear, when I come back, those who are not part of my kingdom have only one choice. It's not all right for them. All of them will not be smiling. 
All they will have left is to mourn. That's right. But when they come back, those who are mine, I'm bringing them to me. That's right. Come on. It's an odd image. Because if we're meeting Jesus in the air, doesn't it seem like we're leaving this place? Which is, I'll let Nick Cage teach you that stuff in his movie. Except there's a common practice. Remember that family dinner we talked about? When the family dinner's going on, how exactly in your family does the last person showing up generally get handled? <laughs> Tell you for 90 years or whatever it's been, uh, in my family, <clears throat> some of you are going to figure out that it's not been that long, but you get the point. I have an aunt who, even when she lived with my grandparents and they deposed, she used to leave the house and she could be the last person to arrive. Uh, she's getting better at it, but for years she's been known as the last person there, the last person, the person that we don't get to eat until she shows up. So what would happen is we all waited for her to come to the door. Do you know what would happen in the first century if you're waiting for someone? You don't wait for them to come in the door. You see this in Acts chapter 28, where Paul the prisoner is coming into Rome, and people go out of the city to meet him as he comes off the boat. This is true, not only one that's important to us, this is the common understanding of how you were supposed to greet a returning general who had conquered, or a government official coming to visit your land. You didn't wait for him with your little flags on Main Street for the parade. Instead, you came in, and you all got into a processional behind the guy who then led you into town, indicating your loyalty or your love or your oath to this person. You want to know why the nations mourn? Because Jesus doesn't just come back as the guy who said, I am the savior of the universe and you all should believe this message alone. He comes back with a group of people who have both died and who are still alive, who have proclaimed the message as they follow him back down saying this, there's the king. This is our Jesus. And the reason he can now be your judge is because we were willing to admit that he is who he claims he is. His message did not go out without any response. The reality is, we become not just those who are gathered with Jesus as a sign that he redeemed us. We're also a message to those who rejected him that there was hope for them. And I think that's why, instead of them having smiles coming to their faces, that they're going to think and wish for the long, long thoughts of winter in this life. It's why in Matthew we find out they mourn. And it's also why, according to Peter, Jesus has delayed his return. That we can add more and more to that processional of Christ of those who understand and acknowledge that he is Lord. For the book of Jude, Jude says it this way, See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones, his hagias. You may know that word as saints. To judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly ways and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. The reality is that the return of Jesus isn't just about us being with him. It's also the fact that it begins the concept of judgment. It begins the concept of rewards. We get what we deserve. It begins the concept of justice. It also begins the concept of Jesus being declared the victor. And those are the things as we continue to study the second coming we'll look at. Does God reward fairly? Is God just in his judgment? Or does he make his decisions based on public relations and, and the, how the wind is blowing? What exactly is Jesus victorious over? And if we're with him, what victory do we share in Jesus? And I hope that by the time we finish those topics, we will find ourselves looking confidently with anticipation for the day when we can say, here comes the Son. 
And so, but he's not just any son. He's our son, King. Amen. This morning, I want to encourage you that there is no reason for you to be left out of 1 Thessalonians 4's account of the gathering together of all those who put their faith, their hope, and their trust in Jesus. As our worship team comes this morning, I want to encourage you, you need to declare Jesus not only as God's Son who came for you, but the King and the Lord of your life, so that you know that when He returns, you will be gathered with Him, and with Him you will forever be. I encourage you to make that decision this morning. Can we please stand as we sing our invitation to the song? 